healing is possible. We share stories of people everywhere who have healed from their diagnoses. Powered by healthrevolution.org. I'm your host, Dr. Anup Kumar. Hello and welcome to the Healing is Possible podcast. My guest today is Jessica Baugh. Jessica is the founder of the Relationship Institute of Palm Beach, providing couples therapy, family counseling, and addiction therapy in South Florida for over 10 years. She has helped thousands of clients with her unique approach to healing, the self-full method. Through her company, Be Self Full, Jessica offers transformational courses and online coaching services that support individuals and couples to form healthy long-term relationships. And today we'll also be talking about her new book, Anxiously Attached, Becoming More Secure in Life and Love. Jessica, thanks for joining us and please share with us your story of healing. Wow, my story of healing. I mean, that's a long story. I think we spend some of our life confused. And when we start the healing process, it's like an unfolding process that is still continuing in many ways. But I would say in my early 20s, or even in my childhood, I mean, I suffered from what typically you would see as like codependency and um, not a very secure sense of self, not really understanding my own needs, some depression and anxiety, and just like some confusion into how to make myself find joy and meaning in my world. And, um, you know, through a lot of therapy and changes, I became a psychotherapist myself. And um, I specialize in in Imago therapy. So it's I specialize in trauma, but relational therapy, a special kind of a relational therapy. And I think through my own relationships and through helping many clients through my private practice, I really started to understand the underpinnings and the dynamics that happen in relationships and how our wounding shows up in our relationships and helping couples and individual kind of unpack their core wounds and how they're manifesting in the here and now. And they're often deeply rooted uh, within us. And so helping them get conscious of what they're projecting and how that's playing out in the relationship energy, even if you're single, how it's played out in your life. Um, and that's a big part of the book is, is looking at the anxious avoidant dance, looking at attachment patterns, because I think attachment is at the core of codependency and many, many, many things. Um, as a psychotherapist, we know that. So it, it was a combination of just kind of doing my own work with a therapist in many workshops and what I was seeing working for many years in my private practice. And it's, it was mirroring um, success and my own healing and just really doing a lot of somatic work and parts work with myself and building compassion um, for different parts of myself and understanding, yeah, about my attachment embedded patterns and how they were showing up in my life and then helping clients kind of unpack that and seeing real transformation happen over time. So I want to ask you, I know that you were using phrases like codependency, codependency, attachment, you know, in the medical world, we often talk about diagnoses, you know, like when, when we when we kind of stack a bunch of these experiences together, or we call them symptoms, then they become a diagnosis. What do you think about that process of taking an experience and making it a diagnosis and medicalizing? Because that's one of the things that concerns me that I see, you know, I'll see sometimes children in the ER who come in and they'll announce to me, oh, I'm oppositional defiant, mm. or, you know, oh, I'm ADHD. And literally they will say, I am, you know, as opposed to I have, or even that this is a label that describes my experience, you know? So how do you see that in your practice and what's your overall take on that? I actually love that you asked that question. Um, I'm actually writing something new about like our left shifted world and how people grab onto a label and it's our brain and our body and our story. And it's, there's so many factors that lie into the root of how we adapt and how we survive and why our behaviors make sense. And I think our society focuses on the behavior and comes up with a diagnosis. And that can be very dangerous because one, it, you become the identified with that only. You don't understand that that is a manifestation of underlying issues um, and that we're so layered, we're so complicated. 
Um, I try in my practice while a, you know, people are like, I'm anxiously attached. I even know embedded patterns show up differently and it's not as simple as a label and you're not a label. It can be helpful if you identify with, oh my God, I, something's wrong with me. And I finally check the boxes on all these symptoms or all these behaviors, but then you can't stop there. That's just a cue into where some deeper healing is and you know, labels can be weaponized. I, pe I see people use the word narcissism. And while that is a truth, it's really means there's an early, early wounding for that person. And, you know, even with anxious attachment, it doesn't mean that you fit that, that box. It means that your nervous system responds in a certain way and, and your behavior starts to make sense. So people stop at the label, the label becomes more than it should be. It's our brains and our body and our the way in which we adapted and survived in our world is so much more complicated than a label. I mean, even the label borderline personality disorder, I have such a hard time with. It's, it's all complex trauma. When you unpack it, it all makes sense. When you start to work with it, the behaviors change and shift, but you, you're not shaming yourself for the symptoms or the behaviors. You start to understand why your behaviors make sense given how you adapted to survive. So I very much believe that whilst you know having a label sometimes is needed, it can even perform a kind of comfort because now you can start to address that you, we have an area it's also also like weaponized in our weapon. It's like in our Western culture, it's like, let's give this label and then let's give this medication. And it's like, whoa, like it, it really takes away from what's underneath the behaviors or why the behaviors got there in the first place that makes sense. So I very much try to stay away from labels. Um, I know my book is a giant label, but a lot of people who have attachment issues have more than one embedded pattern. And I talk about the nervous system and how we adapt brilliantly. And I make sense of all the ad adaptations so that you don't just become the label. Um, yeah. It can be very dangerous. It depends on how it's being used. So can you take us through, uh, just connect the dots from us from your process, your journey of healing to self full, which is the method that you use and then to anxiously attached, which is your new book. What's what's the path and what's the link between these three? Yeah, I mean, my journey of healing. There's a little bit of my story in in the book, but um, for me, developing a relationship with myself that was healthy with all myself, even the parts of myself that I don't like, supposedly don't like, learning that they make sense and they're there for a reason. I call them protectors. Um selfless and selfish are two states of activated sympathetic arousal. There's two states of survival and they come with stories. And um, for those that are listening, sympathetic arousal is fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Um, fawn is people pleasing, which falls into the selfless category. You know, anxious people tend to become self-abandoned, self-sacrificers, and sometimes they attract people who are quote unquote selfish. And there's a reason why this dynamic happens. Self full is a state of ventral connection. It's a state of being in your body and understanding that you can get your needs met and meet the relational needs. And maybe you never experienced that, but it's a sense of safety. And these are states that we move in and out of. And some people, when they're scared, they shift to a selfless state of self-sacrifice or they shift to a selfish state of putting the walls up and not accessing empathy at that moment because they're in a survival place. So becoming self-full is about doing the inner work and learning how to be with yourself in a new way, your parts in a new way, and to show up in a relationship in a new way. And a lot of it has to do with the nervous system, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but safety is everything. And so starting to understand when you're shifting and there's something called neuroception, which I'm also sure that you're aware of, but cues of safety and, and danger are coming at us all, all the time. So I use polyvagal theory and, and you know, as therapists, we understand um, bottom up approach. So there's a lot of somatics around trauma and helping clients see that what's happening in the here and now often has deeper roots if it has a sensational experience. 
So starting to work on those parts and starting to understand that these states we shift in and out of all day long, depending on what's being activated, whether it's really being activated or it's being queued up in our mind, or if it's a subtle reactivity because implicit information, so sensational and like our environment is giving us information all the time and we can't control the way our nervous system responds, but we can start to become aware of it. And so a lot of what I unpack is getting the client into a more ventral place or at least a more awareness of when they are in a ventral place, when they shift into reactivity, what is being touched inside that could be healed so that they can become more aware of when they are in a defensive or self-sacrificing or selfish place and can move more into understanding empathy for themselves, self-compassion and empathy for their partner because who that partner is a wounded individual too that usually has a set of defense mechanisms. So starting to see their whole story and therefore mirroring a seeing in the other person's whole story. Can you tell us what you mean by ventral place? Like when you say to move into a ventral place, what does that mean? Yeah, so I, I, I built a lot off of Stephen Porges's work, which he works around the vagus nerve and he, um, our social engagement system. So when we're in a place of safety, like you and I are in right now, we're making eye contact, we can share, you know, when you're in a place of safety, you feel it in your body. It, it, it's a sense of like ease. And when you're in a ventral place, you feel calm and People with anxious attachment have an amygdala that's hyper-focused for abandonment. And a lot of being or someone being unavailable or something in their past has primed them in a way to not always feel a sense of ease in their body. There's a sense of uneasiness that lives within them. And that that is from programming from very early on. And so working into a place of ease, trust, getting the right support, trusting much of the right support, because sometimes anxious people will zero in on one person. Um, so expanding your support system and your understanding of yourself, um, creating safety that you're, you know, you have this inherent trust that usually during early developmental years through co-regulation. So through the connection you have with your primary caregivers if you didn't get proper attunement or co-regulation, there is an inherent distrust in your body and your nervous system and your outlook on relationships. So understanding that might live inside of you and we wanna move you to a place of trust, which means you know trusting and depending on the right people enough so that your nervous system starts to recognize what real safety really is. I love that you are, you're talking about somatic theory or, you know, bringing the body and the mind closer together, you know, I think perhaps more than anything else, that's one of the crucial things missing in today's healthcare system, that perspective, whether you're talking about what we call, you know, suffering and mental experience, or whether we're talking about what we call physical diagnosis, you know, the truth is, and on this podcast, we've had so many guests who heal from what we think are physical conditions um, by doing something that we think is mental. Like, for example, some emotion that was suppressed for decades, perhaps, right? And when that's released, the physical system heals, you know, or pursuing what a person really loves all of a sudden changes their body. And I think it really speaks to how we have really split this mind and body. Even the fact that we have two words for it is revealing, but that we really have split this mind and this body. And I think all of all of the people that are communicating at the next level now are kind of bringing these closer and closer together. At Health Revolution, we call it mind-body theory, mm -hmm. that the, the body is the pattern of the mind, like ice is the pattern of water, right? Ice and water are not fundamentally different, but they are one and the same thing. And, and I love how you bring that together. Yeah. How can I mean... we use that, right? In well, let me, let me let you comment. Cause I feel like, yeah, to... I, I feel like I have a lot to say about that. I mean, I, I study interpersonal neurobiology Okay. and we refer to it as the embodied brain. And, and what that means is that we have a brain in our heart and we have a brain in our gut and we also have stored memory in our tissue. And there is the vagus nerve and the, the nervous system that connects like a stream body to brain. Right. And so 
our brain, our body. And for those who are listening, you know, when you're doing therapy, you can work on your thoughts. But the truth is your body is what um, is storing memory and has so much more wisdom and information. And so there's a belly brain and there's a heart brain and then there's your skull brain. And so when we refer to this, we say the embodied brain, we mean the full connection, gut, heart, brain, even muscles um, store cellular memory. So more often than not, 80% of the information that you're receiving and trying to make sense of 80% is being sent up from your body to your brain. And your brain is actually much slower at processing the information than your body is. So I think there's a shift even in psychotherapy, at least I hope that there's a shift in the world to start paying close attention to sensations that come from the body because those are embedded and start to work with the body to make real change because the narrative that happens in the brain or the story that we make up in the brain is so secondary to the actual information that's coming from the body. And so people get stuck a lot. Um, and I do think, I mean, there are diagnoses that are truly medical diagnoses, but there are a lot of things that are like manifesting in your world because there's a disconnect or there's not proper support to process the information that's coming up from your body and trying to make sense of it. And the resources out there are limited, but there's so much more wisdom in the body than there is in the brain. And we need to focus more on that. We live in a very left hemisphere shifted culture and we don't think as whole in the left. We kind of separate and look at the details and we need the left, but the right side, which connects to the body, looks at a more holistic view of the world, relates differently um, in a different way. So I think it's really important, like your convers, you know, this conversation and really helping people understand, like get out of your head and start to get into your body and get people who can help you work through what's coming up in your body, because that's actually what's going to unlock the embedded patterns and stored trauma that you might be carrying around. That's going to create physical sy symptoms for you, whether it's depression or anxiety, but the list goes on. And you can address those physical sy symptoms, but if you don't address the core of what's going on in your body, you're just going to be kind of medicating the symptoms rather than really kind of holding the suppressed embedded pain or memory system, the implicit memory system that lives in our body. Yeah, so beautifully put. You know, it's over time because of the emphasis on brain and neuroanatomy and obviously in, in healthcare, it's, it's a philosophy of physicalism and it's a biomedical science that emphasizes a human being as a physical structure. That's our model of anatomy. And so brain obviously as, as a main center gets emphasized. And what we're seeing now is I, I would say like the migrating of the brain, right? Like we know the, the cardiac brain, as you're saying, like the, all the connections that happen in the heart. And now I mean, the gut is just exploding, like with microbiome and, you know, the, the metaphor of using your gut, making decisions, making gut decisions and all of these things that brain, the understanding of what the brain is, not just as a physical mass, but as a center of intelligence is expanding through the body. And I mean, this is what, for example, in, in yoga, they talk about chakras. And that's exactly what it is. It is other centers of intelligence in the body that we are now starting to map through our expanded understanding of brain in in um in qigong there are the different dantians right there's the the upper the middle and the lower and so this knowledge has existed for millennia and and we are starting to integrate all this like you said because i think we are starting to accept that um right brain or right mind or right bodied thinking or right bodied experience mm -hmm. is absolutely essential to contextualized left bodied experience. Yes. And it's like, you know, the right side and the left side, we need them both and they need to be in communication. And we focus more on the left success, individualism, like so much more of how we relate is transactional and we need that in a survival sense, but the right is being so misunderstood and we need to tap back into like more of what our ancestors know is to have a relationship with our land, have more community, be in a felt sense of meaning with life, being more present um, without an agenda. And I think, you know, 
you know, when you're looking at, and I talk about this in the book, but the heart is where you store positive and negative memories around connection. And the gut often is stores fear and, and memories around fear. So we actually store memory in these centers and everyone thinks, you know, memory is stored in the brain, which is also stored in the brain, but embedded trauma is stored in other parts of our body. And so the, the research is now showing this, thank God, you know, we're finally becoming more aware of how interconnected our whole body is. And you can't really talk about the brain without talking about the other centers of um, information because they're all layered and working together. Um, so I, I learned a lot in my research and I'm humbled by, you know, still learning how and or it's never you're left, you're this, you're that. It's always an and or there's always a layering effect. There's always a holistic view that we have to take into account. Your history matters. Your past lives in your present. Your past lives in your cellular memory. And so unpacking the embedded patterns, especially when it comes to attachment, is starting to get in touch with the sensational world, the somatic world of your felt experience and realizing that some of your pain and your felt experience that you're feeling here and now is actually implicit memory. It's not explicit memory. So it's sensational memory. And having clients really understand that is like kind of creating more consciousness for them. So do you, I'm sure you bring this into the book, Anxiously Attached. Can you talk a little bit about how you, how you structure the book and also maybe give us one or two suggestions that you might have in the book that people who are hearing this and people who may be having a hard time or are anxiously attached, what can we do to move forward? Yeah, absolutely. I have the book here. So this is what it looks like. I'm very proud of it. It's four years of research and a lot of help. It was not created just by me alone. I had a lot of really great professionals help me and I learned a lot in the process, but the first part of the book really unpacks why. I share a little bit about my personal story so the reader understands that I'm not just a psychotherapist expert. I'm a human being who has suffered <laughs> tremendously from this as well. And I want you to know I'm here with you co-regulating. I use language that makes you feel like we are doing this together. And um, the first part of the book explains how you adapted to survive and helping you identify your core wounds. I look at love addiction and narcissism and the anxious avoidant dance, which if you wanna know more about that, I can definitely go on about that because I think that's at the root of what anxious people struggle with. Please and do, I provide, please do. Yeah. yeah, I provide a path for healing the anxious avoidant dance because I feel like all relationships have a dance around intimacy and it's it can actually work if you start to understand the nervous system. So I start to unpack the nervous system as well in the first part of the book. The middle of the book is about your internal process. And I, um, I provide five somatic meditations that you can also download and listen. So you're going into the body and you're meeting what is, and you're kind of working with those sensational experiences. And if they get really intense, I really strongly suggest bringing them to a professional that can hold the somatic experience with you because it's in that integration. That's really important. So the middle of the book is a lot about, um, going into the world of somatics and starting to unpack your embedded patterns. And then third part of the book is integrating that knowledge into your past or current relationships and learning to love in a new way and starting to see your embedded patterns in a more compassionate way, um, kind of adopting parts work. It, it's got a little IFS in it, internal fam family systems type work in it. So it's me, it's my story. It's in explaining why you adapted the way you did in the most compassionate way. It's understanding that avoidant people's nervous system regulates in a very different way than an anxious person's nervous system regulates. So while we wanna run and get close and connect and tend to be codependent or want connection, cause that's our biological imperative, they want connection too, but the way they calm themselves down is to shut down, detach, take time. And so you have two certain nervous systems kind of responding, one wanting connection and the other one kind of shutting down and it's perpetuating um, reactivity and co-dysregulation in, um, in the, the dynamic of the couple. And so once you start to understand what's going on on that level, 
I think your communication around conflict changes. And I, I um, chap, chap, is it chapter nine? No, chapter eight talks about if you have someone with more uh, avoidant tendencies, this is how you can work through conflict differently with your partner. And this is how you can kind of uh, evolve through that. And this is why, you know, they're shutting down, they need to reach out in vulnerability, and they need to look at these pieces and your kind of reactivity and needing to reach out and fix your anxiety in that moment. And these are the pieces that you guys both need to work on. So you can get back into a state of ventral connection faster and back into a state of homeostasis within the relational energy faster. So I provide a path for anyone who's single and wants to heal their embedded patterns, but also for couples that are stuck in a little bit of an anxious avoidant dynamic. And for people who are unsure, like, is this relationship healthy for me? I kind of, in a very compassionate way, kind of explain the difference between avoidance and narcissism. And not that narcissism isn't workable. It's just a lot harder to have an authentic a uh, connection because that person doesn't have like an authentic connection to self. And so I'm very compassionate in the way that I explain all these things so that the reader can really start to just really get a fuller picture of what they need and how they can move forward regardless whether it's with their partner or um with without their partner. What's what's one thing that someone could do now? Like if somebody's listening and they are feeling anxious and or feeling attached and want to gain that sense of being self full. Is there one thing that can take them a step closer? Yeah. I mean, so if you're feeling anxious and you feel it in your gut and you're feeling a sense of uneasiness in your whole body, your relationships probably bringing that up to the surface, whether or not your relationship is workable is secondary to this is probably how you felt at some point in childhood or really early wounding because if it lives in the body and you're feeling so uneasy there's a chance that your system feels like when it's in connection it's waiting for the shoe to drop it's hyper vigilant and it lives in that state as a way to protect you and to start to befriend that part of your system and see it as a protector in you even though it sucks it sucks right like but it's, it's literally ha probably how you felt as an infant or a young, young person. And that sense of uneasiness is probably something you've been dealing with your whole life. So it's not that we want to get rid of it. It's we want to shift to understand it, form compassion, hold that experience, hold those sensations with someone who is secure, whether that's a coach, a therapist, or a non-judgmental friend, start to hold those sensations. We don't want to avoid them. And our partner isn't necessarily fully responsible for them. They're responsible to help us understand, but they're not always the cause of these uneasy sensations. They're bringing them up inside of us so that we can heal them. So get out of the blame a little. Um, I'm not saying because everybody's in a different situation and I can't comment on, you know, everybody's relationship. But if you can get out of the blame a little and more into, wow, this lives inside of me and my relationship is bringing it up in the here and now. And how can I hold this with someone who actually can hold it rather than going back to a person who can't hold it? If they're very avoidant, they can't hold that because of what if their own wounding has happened. How can I bring this anxiety to someone who can help hold it, heal it, integrate it, make bigger sense of it so that I'm not as effective and you know, a big part of the book is forming self-compassion around these parts. And it's that, that we get rid of these parts. We actually start to befriend these parts. I've heard that so much, you know, in talking to different people about any variety of suffering or pain or diagnosis or anything is that there is often a time when we look at a part that was either supposed to be bad or causing the problem. And we say, oh, this actually in a way was there to help me in some way and that that recognition is i feel not something that anybody can tell someone you know we can kind of say this is a possibility but that can be really hard to hear and bring out a lot of anger and so many things but when a person recognizes it from within from themselves it's life-changing Oh my God, you are like speaking gold to me this morning and uh you're so right it's I mean, even I work with addiction, it's like even the addict part of you that needed to do that 
to survive. We really need to look at what you were escaping or what you were medicating that was just too hard for your system or the part of you that's bossy or greedy or demanding or controlling. That part of you is trying to survive as well. Like they're, I call them protectors. Yeah. So in my book, it's like starting to notice your protectors and, you know, thanking them. Thank you. Thank them for being there because they're there for a reason. And we don't need to take their advice when we really start to unpack what's underneath, what they're actually protecting you from, which you'd be surprised when you unpack what they're protecting you from. You're like, oh, now I know why you're there. Now I know why this critical part is there. And it's so layered because we internalize so much when we're young. And, and some of these voices or protectors aren't even things that we created. They're things that we have taken on our survival critical protector parts of our parents or our culture or whatever and they live inside of us for good reason and once we can honor that reason and, and start to see what they're protecting that's when we hit the gold and we can they stay with us you know and and but we don't take their advice as much anymore we shift out of thank thank you for your advice around fear right now I understand what you're trying to protect me from whether it's abandonment or suffocation or whatever I hear you. And now I have other tools and different ways of looking at this, but I can, can't thank you enough for your advice. And, you know, it's like, we welcome them. We befriend them. Well, thank you for saying, you said at the beginning, the, your healing journey and how, you know, they're like phases of life for the, for me, this is my healing journey, you know, talking about these things and bringing healing to hopefully healthcare and many more people that, don't know healing is possible. It's just, it's just not there in healthcare for so many. It's all about managing and struggling and treading water in so many cases, but people heal from pretty much any condition that exists, somebody has healed from. And we need to tell those stories more. So thank you for helping us show, helping showing us the way. Your book is Anxiously Attached, Becoming More Secure in Life and Love. Jessica, the name of the show is Healing is Possible. When you hear this phrase, what does this mean to you? You know, as I wrote this book, so many people are contacting me and telling me, thank you, I'm healing, this is helpful. And as a professional, I'm still healing. And I think healing is definitely possible. Healing happens in relationships the right supportive relationships, the right processing of what's coming up, healing happens. Healing is always available, even if you don't know what the concept means, because I think our culture does a really poor job of love and light and yoga retreats. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but healing is about being with more and more of yourself in a more compassionate way in the support of more nurturing and loving people in the right community. That is what we biologically are wired for. And science is showing that and healing is absolutely possible. Try not to think of it as what's a subscription or how do I heal? Try to think about moving towards warmth, non-judgmental people who can hold space and, and stay open because it is a journey. It's not like, oh, I'm healed and I'm done. You know, there are layers upon layers upon layers, but when you're in it, it's a felt experience. So it's hard to explain it, but when you're in it, you're like, oh my God, I'm in it. And it's hard, but I, I can feel it. And I can feel the change in the insight and the growth and the dual awareness that's coming. And I just need to keep trusting the process and keep leaning on support because I don't think that healing comes from a book, even though there's a lot of healing that came from my book. I think it's getting the information, starting to understand it, and then healing through healing relationships. The stories shared here are the experiences of the speakers. They're not intended as medical advice. Join our network or simply share your story at healthrevolution.org. Healing is possible.